I want to continue our series entitled All In, Holding Nothing Back. And the title of our message today is, Is Your Love Worth Giving? We're going to be looking at John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. So I'll give you a moment to get out your Bibles. We're going to be looking again at John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. Every one of us wants love. All of us want love. We are wired to desire love in our lives. And we want to be loved, and most of us want to give love. We want love. Love is a part of who we are. But the problem with human love is that our love in and of itself is imperfect. Our love comes with conditions. Our love has requirements, right? In our human understanding, our love is very selfish in and of itself. People, we want people to act a certain way. We want to, uh, we need to be in a specific mood. Or we need to uh, be thinking in a specific way for our love to be what we consider to be its fullest potential. Our love is very selfish. It's self-centered. It is imperfect. In fact, a little a teacher asked a little girl what love was, and she said, Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne, and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> right? Love in our world is imperfect, and it's based on the superficial. Amen. Right? The minute that the cologne changes to something we're not too fond of, our love fades. The minute someone's actions change in a way that we don't like, our love begins to fade. Right? We, we struggle with loving our, our co-workers. We struggle with loving our friends. Some of us struggle with loving our spouses. Because when their attitude changes, when their actions change, we get upset. Our imperfect love lets us down. It keeps us from loving with all that is within each of us. And so the question today for us, is our love worth giving? Is our love worth giving? Jesus had a lot to say about love. In fact, in the verses that we just read, he mentioned love several times. And in the, about 18 verses in a row, if you go back a few verses, he mentions love like 30 times. I mean, love is mentioned a lot in these last moments that Jesus has with his disciples. He's wanting them to know how much he loves them. And when you and I are asking ourselves the question, is our love worth giving? Our answer starts with accepting Jesus' love. Amen. We must accept his love. He says in verse 9 of chapter 15, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus knew that he was soon to leave this world. He wanted his disciples to know how much he loved them. So he simply said, I love you. You guys remember when you were talking to your significant other, maybe your husband, your wife, and the first time you said I love you to them? Do you remember that and what a special moment it was? In fact, it had been drilled into my head so strongly by my parents that I love you wasn't a casual phrase that you just threw out. It meant something special. So it took me a long time to tell my wife I loved her. 
I mean, we had dated for a long time before I said, I love you. It was special. It meant something. And when Jesus told his disciples, plain as day, I love you, it meant something special to them. <coughs> the God of all creation, the Messiah, was telling them, I love you. And the truth that you and I must take hold of today, if we're to demonstrate God's love to a lost and a dying world as that Jesus Christ loves you and he loves me. In our world, in our society, we grasp for love in all kinds of places. And many times we're let down. But there is one guaranteed source of love in this world and that is Jesus Christ. He loves us. It is such a foundational fundamental truth to our world that God loves us. If you've been in the church any amount of time, you've heard John 3.16. You've heard over and over again how much God loves us, and we can become desensitized to it. But think about this. The God of all creation, who put the stars in their places, who put the sun and the moon and the planets where they're supposed to be, who created the galaxy and the universe, who Bring life into you who created the animals and he created all the vegetation in the place. The God of powerful almighty who sits upon the throne. He loves you. Amen. And he loves me. No matter what people have spoken over us in our lives. No matter what our parents may be said to us. No matter what people have said to us. Our enemies, those who do not love us. Those who have hurt us. No matter what they've said to you. Know this. God loves you. Amen. And our lives begin with that foundational truth. Amen. God loves me. Amen. In fact, one of the first songs you probably learned growing up in church at vacation Bible school or in Sunday school was Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, I am weak, but he is strong. A simple little song that has such profound meaning if you and I can grasp it. One preacher said long ago that everything he needed to know about theology he learned in that song Jesus loves me. That song first appeared in a, in a poem in 1859 and it was written by Anna Warner. And one of the characters in her story comforts another child with Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so, a couple of years later, a, a gentleman by the name of William Bradbury, he came across that poem, and so he wrote it a, tone, a tune to it, and now we have our song, Jesus Loves Me. It is spread across the world like wildfire. It is in many different languages translated for everyone, for children all over the world to be able to sing. A simple poem turned into a song that is so rich in truth that it can still make a grown person cry when they truly understand what it means. Jesus loves you. This I know. He loves me. No matter what I do, no matter how I act, no matter what I say, nothing can exhaust God's love for me. Nothing can exhaust God's love for you. No matter my mistakes, no matter what I've done, no matter about my poor choices, God still loves me. And he loves you. Amen. And accepting the love of Christ, accepting the love of God is important to our daily lives. And it is essential when we begin to look at is our love worth giving to others. It is essential that you and I understand that Jesus loves us. He says earlier in chapter 15 that he is the vine and that we are the branches. He says, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And he tells us in verse 9 what? Abide 
in love. Abide in the truth that God loves us. Listen, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Apart from his love, what we do will not produce eternal results. That's why Paul wrote, I can prophesy, but without love, it is nothing more than tinging brass and clanging cymbals. If I speak in tongues without love, if I have all knowledge and I have all understanding of scripture, but I do not have love, it is meaningless. And that love starts with Jesus Christ. It starts with abiding in him and recognizing that it is through his perfect love that I can share that love with others. I have to take his perfect love and share it with other people. And so it starts our effectiveness regarding our lives in Christ and reaching people with the gospel begins with accepting and understanding God's love for me. Because listen to this. Just like God loves you, he loves your neighbor. Just like God loves me, he loves the obnoxious co-worker that's always giving you a hard way to go. Just like God loves me, he loves that spouse or that ex-spouse that's hurting you. Just like God loves me, he loves our enemies too. Amen. So if I understand the truth that God loves me, and then I further understand the truth that God loves my enemies and my neighbor and my friends. It should affect the way that I live my life. Amen. Jesus, his love was characterized by sacrifice. Verse 13 of chapter 15 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his Friends. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life for his friends. And what's great about God is that Jesus elevated his disciples from servants to friends. He says that they were no longer servants, but they were his friends. See, disciples typically when they were uh, uh, disciples of a rabbi, a teacher, they were considered servants of that teacher. They were to serve the teacher in any way they possibly could. But Jesus says, yes, I am your rabbi. Yes, I am the Messiah. But you're not my servants. You're my friends. Yeah. And so the question then for us is, when we ask is, uh, our love worth giving to others is do we return Jesus' love? That sacrificial love. John 14 and 15, uh, verses 14 and 15 say, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father. I know to you. If you know Christ as Lord and Savior, you're a friend of God. Amen. God loves you. He gave his life for you. He laid down and sacrificed everything so that you and I could have eternal life. Amen. It's one thing to say, Jesus loves me. But can you and I truly say, I love Jesus? So we must accept God's love. We must accept Accept Jesus' love. And we must also return Jesus' love. Amen. Can I honestly say that? Do I love Jesus? Do I love God? If I do, that love will re be reflected in how we live our lives. That's a tough question to ask. Because our imperfect love is based on how we feel so many times at a particular moment in time. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I get upset at God. You ever get upset at God? Sometimes I don't like how things go. Sometimes I don't like the way he does things. And in my imperfect love, I get angry. But if I abide and accept Christ's love, and understand that no matter what I've done, no matter what I am, God still loves me. If I accept it and understand it, I can then return that perfect love back to him, knowing that God has my very best interests at heart, that God sacrificed himself for me. And so it's not based on how 
I feel is based on his love for me. Because his love is perfect, I can reflect back to him that perfect love. Mark uh, chapter 12, verse 30 says, You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. God, our love for God, must be the driving force for our lives. So how does re uh, returning God's love Showing God love manifest in our lives. Well, truthfully, it's not too much different than any other relationship in your life. It's built on trust. It's built on communication. And it's built on adoration. Or to put it in Christianese, faith, <laughs> prayer, and worship. Amen. That's what our relationship with God is based on. And when I love him... Those three elements will be evident in my life. Trust in him, faith in him, communication with him through prayer, and worship of him, adoration of him. If I love God, those three will be prevalent in my life. Our love for him must be all-consuming. When I first fell in love with Kelly, she was constantly on my mind. All the time. Eating breakfast, pumping gas, at work. Wherever I was, I was thinking about how much I loved her and how much I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. My love for her affected the decisions that I made in my life. I didn't look at other girls or other women. I wanted to spend as much time as I could with her. I changed who I chose to spend time with. I worked really, really hard to make sure I could give her everything that I possibly could, that I could provide for her, that I could spoil her. I went that extra mile where when we were dating, I would go and I would uh, go to her work and I would open her trunk and put a rose in a card almost every single time she was at work at the movie theater because I wanted to come out, open the trunk and see that rose in card so she'd know I was thinking about her. She was on my mind all the time. I loved her. It affected my actions, my attitude. It even affected my diet, believe it or not. I started eating turkey burgers and turkey bacon and turkey meatloaf. Because yeah. everything's got to be turkeys. Right? I made myself eat bacon that had been rinsed in water because she didn't want the grease on it. I stopped eating fried eggs because they were too greasy. I changed my diet and ate things that I did not care for because I loved her. And just like with God, uh, just like with Kelly and our relationships with our spouses and those that we love, our relationship, our love with God should be affect, should affect our decisions, Amen. our thoughts, our attitudes, our focus. We should just want to spend time with God. Amen. Throughout the day, we don't have to get down and say a, a King James 12-hour prayer for God to know that we love him, we just got to think about him. A quick sentence, God, I love you. Amen. Throughout the day, that's why the, the author wrote, pray without ceasing. Throughout the day, my mind is be centered upon God because of my love for him so that at any given time, I can call out and tell him I love him. Amen. How grateful I am to him. When I need him, I can say, God, I need you and not feel guilty about it because I've ignored him for three weeks. Because I love him. I care about him. Our whole life should be transformed and consumed by our love for God. So many times in our lives, our actions and our attitudes are the way that they are because we are not consumed by God's love. And if I am not consumed by God's love, I cannot give the world God's love. I cannot show the world God's love. I must first be consumed by his love. And my love for him 
before I can demonstrate it to this world. Amen. Which brings us to the final point. We must share Jesus' love with others. Before it, you and I can have a love worth giving, we must first accept God's love. We must return God's love. And that is when we will be able to share his love with others. Jesus said in verse 17 in John 15, These things I command you, that you love one another. John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. If you have your Bibles out, or if you can highlight, highlight that verse. This is my commandment, that you love one another, and here's the key, as I have loved you. See that qualification there, as I have loved you, is the key to loving others outside of ourselves. It is specific in how we should love people. It knocks the walls down out of any definition that you and I previously had about love. We are to love as he loves. No demands, no conditions, no requirements. Amen. That's how and the only way that you and I can love our enemies as we are supposed to. Amen. Is that we love the way Jesus loves us. Because our love does not have conditions, demands, or requirements on it. We're not expecting something in return. Ulterior motives will absolutely destroy somebody's life. Amen. When I give something with the expectation of getting something in return, the minute that expectation is not met, I will become upset, depressed, angry, bitter, and rejected. But if I give something with no expectation of return, I will experience joy despite their reaction. Amen. I don't have to have anything from them to give joy and to love them because I have no expectation, I have no ulterior motives in giving. Amen. Right? Uh, many times we have those ulterior motives, but Jesus said they are not acceptable because my love for you does not carry with it any ulterior motives. Amen. My love for you is perfect, and my love for you makes no demands on you in terms of you have to change who you are. God will never love you any more or any less than he does right now. He loved you so much that he died before you even knew him as Lord and Savior. He loves mankind so much that he died for the ones who pulled the beard out of his face. He died for the ones who whipped him on his back. He died for the ones that gambled for his clothes. He died for the ones that spit in his face. He died for all of those who rejected him. His creation that rejected him. That's why Romans 5 8 is so awesome. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When he was on the cross, he wasn't crossing names off the list because of what they did to him. He was dying for every single one of them that rejected him. For every soldier that rejected him. For every Pharisee and Sadducee that rejected him. For every Jew that rejected him. Every Gentile that rejected him. He died for Peter who would deny him three times. He died for the disciples who ran and hid. He died for Judas who betrayed him for silver. He died for every, all of us despite our actions despite who we are and who we were. Amen. That's love. Amen. And so when we look at that kind of love, 
It is only with that understanding that we can give a love worth giving. Amen. That we can share a love worth someone having. Because love without strings attached is the only kind of love we should show. Amen. I love my wife with all my heart. But I have no strings attached to my love for her. And I believe she feels the same about me. She obviously has no physical strings or requirements attached to our love, as you can see. <laughs> there was no stipulation about how much weight I could gain or put on or my beard or my hair or any of that. She loves me regardless. No conditions. No demands. She loves me for who I am despite the decisions that I make. And I love her the same way. And it is that love that allows us to show our kids how much we love them. Yeah. And they see how much we love each other. So hopefully they'll demonstrate love to their wives and then to their children. And the same principle applies to our relationship with God. I love him. He loves me with no strings attached. So I love my enemy with no strings attached. My neighbor with no strings attached. And by God's grace and mercy, they see my love for them reflected, uh, for reflecting God's love, and they make a decision to serve Him. Amen. And then they love somebody else that's unlovable. Right. And then my life is changed. That's how we produce disciples, is through unconditional love. Amen. Loving people, even when they're unlovable. But let me say this, I feel I must qualify but loving someone does not mean I condone their behavior. Amen. Loving someone does not mean I enable their bad behavior. Amen. Mm -hmm. Loving someone means that you love them and you do not change the way you treat them in spite of their behavior. Amen. But we do not condone it nor enable it. Churches should be a church of love. Anyone can walk through the doors and set upon the pews and see God's love demonstrated from the minute they walk through the door to the minute that they leave. That they're so impacted by God's love that they have to stop and question the decisions that they make and how they're living their lives. But it does not mean I condone their behavior. <coughs> I can love someone and not agree with them. And we have been taught in this world, especially of late, that if you don't agree with someone, you must not love them. And that is not the case. We are to love everyone, and that love does not change based on their opinions or their perspective or their behavior. It remains the same. But I would preach Jesus Christ and his love, regardless of who the audience is. Amen. Jesus, in the most beautiful way possible, after he told his disciples, or, I'm sorry, he demonstrated his love before he told his disciples how much he loved them. In John 13, you'll see something that if you've been in church any amount of time, I'm sure that you've read, heard, preached on, taught, which is the washing of the disciples' feet. In verses 3 through 5, it clearly explains what he did. And I don't want to be gross, but I will tell you that they didn't have sneakers to cover their feet. They had sandals, and they didn't have socks, and they walked on dirty, muddy roads. And it was customary to have someone, a servant, to wash the feet when you were a guest in someone's house for dinner. In this instant, the disciples showed up with dirty feet to pass over dinner. And they probably saw the water basin, but when there was no servant, they just walked on in and sat down and started getting ready to have the meal. It must have caught them by surprise, though, when Jesus Christ, their Messiah, stood up, took off his outer garment, put a towel around his waist, 
and slowly began to wash the feet of all 12 disciples. Now, I don't think we truly appreciate what that means. I cannot see the President of the United States, whoever it is, or the king or queen of any country being willing to wash the feet of a dirty peasant. To stoop down and to humble oneself to wash somebody's feet. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the same one who sits at the right hand of the Father, the high priest who makes intercession for us and mediates between us and the Father, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the same Jesus that was before Abraham was, he existed, the same Jesus who was there when the sun was put in its place in the stars, Jesus, the God of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, stooped and washed the nasty, dirty feet of those who were supposed to be serving him. Yet I'm unwilling to bring my enemy a coffee yes. or give them a kind word, to give them a smile or a handshake or to make eye contact. I'm unwilling to do that little for those around me, but the God of the universe humbled himself and washed the feet of mere men. Yes. Yes. Like, I don't know if we grasp that. Or understand what that means. Thank you, Jesus. My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. He demonstrated to them what true love means. That's right. It means in spite of how I feel. It means in spite of my position. And it means in spite of who it is that I am commanded to love. I am to love them. And treat them accordingly. Amen. Can you imagine the look on the disciples' faces when he began to wash their feet? He washed the feet of his enemies and the feet of those who loved him. You and I are to love Everyone whom God puts in our lives, despite how they treat us and their attitudes toward us. In 2017, in this year of being all in, of holding nothing back, I want Revive Outreach Church to be a church characterized by love. I want us to be a church that fulfills the mission that God laid upon our hearts. To revive an awareness of Christ in our communities through compassion, love, service, and evangelism. See, service is a direct result of love. And when I love someone and I serve them, then I can tell them and show them how great God is and how much Jesus loves them. I want people to come here and feel God's love. I want them to come here and know that we love them despite their past, despite their present, despite their poor decisions, despite whatever they have gone through in their lives. We will love them. I want to see lives changed by the power of Jesus Christ's love. I want to see the lost found. I want to see the sick healed. I want to see the hungry fed. I want to see the naked clothed. I want to see the oppressed uplifted. I want to see the depressed set free. I want to see Stafford and Fallon and Spotsylvania and Massaponics and the city of Fredericksburg turned up by the love of Jesus Christ. And it starts with me. And it starts with you. Reflecting a love, giving a love, 
that's worth receiving. An eternal, perfect love based solely in Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach a loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.